Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Matter of Trust, a COVID-19 conversation. My name is Minette Seat, and this is the first in a series of webinars to address the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect on communities of color. WQED is part of this initiative proudly with, in partnership with the Poise Foundation and the Black Equity Coalition, and with major funding from the Hillman Family Foundations, Pittsburgh Foundation, the Poise Foundation, and Giant Eagle. With our partners, uh, WQED has launched a year-long initiative to help address questions and build trust in the COVID-19 vaccine in the communities most impacted by the virus. In this edition, we'll focus on thoughtful conversation on some of the myths surrounding the vaccine and discuss the importance of community accessibility and getting vaccinated. We've got a great panel tonight. Our panelists are Dr. Tracy Conti, Assistant Professor and Executive Vice Chair in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And she also serves as Program Director of the UPMC McKeesport Family Medicine Res Residency. Among many other accomplishments, she is also a member of the Black Equity Coalition. Welcome, Dr. Conti. Thank you so much for having me. We are also joined by Mayor Sharday Jones. Mayor Jones made history as the youngest and first African-American woman to be elected mayor of the historic town of Braddock, Pennsylvania. She has a BA from Carlo University and hopes to inspire young adults to create a new identity for themselves and for their community. Welcome, Mayor Jones. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Uh, next up is Reverend Dr. Christopher Conti. Reverend Christopher Conti is a senior pastor of Emanuel Pittsburgh Church in Rankin, Pennsylvania, as well as an accomplished practicing emergency medicine physician. He has served his country as a critical care emergency transport physician in Afghanistan and is also married to Dr. Tracy's. And he is also one of our, as one of our pa panelists, is a devoted community and faith leader. Welcome, Chris Conti. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for joining us. And finally, Mark Lewis is president and CEO of the Poise Foundation for nearly two decades. Poise is an historic organization with a mission of assisting the Black community in achieving self-sustaining practices through strategic leadership, collective giving, grant making, and advocacy. Welcome, Mark. Good evening. I'm going to start with you, actually, Mark. Um, for a quick history lesson, tell us why Poise and the Black Equity Coalition made this initiative a priority. Yeah, so first of all, the foundation as a whole, uh, we're very interested in, our mission is really about helping Pittsburgh's Black community become more self-sufficient and self-sustaining. And to do that, uh, we, all, we often talk about business, we often talk about a lot of things, but if you don't have your health, then it's hard to accomplish anything else. So public health and, and uh, medical health, health care are extremely important to the foundation. And so about, I guess, 14 months ago, um, myself and a few others uh, were asked to come to a table to discuss how the uh, pandemic was impacting the Black community. And so that was kind of the formation of the Black Equity Coalition. And, and I love the word coalition because that's exactly what it is. It's a group of various people from a lot of different industries coming together, trying to address this specific problem today, but looking in the future to address a lot of the issues that impacted our community even prior to the pandemic. Uh, but the pandemic itself, uh, when that hit us, um, I always told people my first response was, here's going to be a disease where it's finally going to be equitable because it's airborne. It doesn't care who it impacts. It's not looking at any particular neighborhood. And then about a month into the pandemic, uh, we got word that, as usual, the Black community was being hit two or three times harder than you know, the general community. And, and again, that goes back to all the disparities that existed prior to uh, the disease or the virus itself. And so why this is important to me uh, is for a few reasons. Uh, one, as I mentioned, black and brown people um, were impacted probably two to three times more than uh, their white counterparts. If you look at cases, hospitalizations, and really even deaths, if you, if you uh, look in a certain way. Uh, at the same time, the black and brown community we are extremely underrepresented when it comes to vaccines. And then the third point I'll make is just the fact that the virus is still out there. We still have cases going on. We still have hospitalizations, even though they've been declining. And we still have deaths, even though they've been declining. So to me, when you put those into the coalition, when you put those three factors together, uh, this is a conversation that needs to take place. And I do just want to segue off of one of the things you said. If people, after this conversation is over, go to the Black Equity Coalition website, there is an excellent uh, handbook um, that talks about the inequities, that talks about the research that's needed, and talks about exactly all the things you've just touched on about why this is so impactful to communities of color. Um, another, you also touched on something else, which is that 
we've been having this conversation for over a year now, and, and I'm kind of apprehensive that people might start thinking, it's been a year, I'm going to be okay. So why is getting vaccinated still important, for, especially for our communities? Right. Again, I think it's um, the fact that when you look at you know, data that's slowly coming out, you know, that's another issue I think we have to address um, you know, beyond this, this uh, pandemic. It's just the fact that without great data or without good data, it's very hard to pinpoint where you know, certain interventions need to be made. And so we are, you know, like I said, 14, maybe 15 months, maybe 16 months now into this pandemic, and we still do not have good data coming from you know, the various authorities to be able to pinpoint where should we most uh, uh, you know, be putting vaccines into our community? Who should we be talking to the most? Data is beginning to come out. And some of that data is showing the fact that, again, you look at the uh, neighborhoods with the least amount of vaccines, those tend to be in the black and brown communities, right? Or even if it's in a community that's not predominantly black and brown, those in those communities that have the least amount of vaccine tend to be black and brown people. So, you know, if you look at that fact, and, and uh, there's other statistics I'm sure some medical doctors can, can share, uh, but again, the virus has not gone away. Yes, we've done a, a pretty good job of vaccinating people, especially our older population, but the virus is still out there. And so, you know, just because you're young does not mean you're immune to it. It doesn't mean that because you're young that you'll be asymptomatic. And so there's still a risk. And because of that, this you know, whole push for vaccinating our community is still important. Uh, Dr. Tracy Conti, just to pivot off those figures that Mark was alluding to, I think I looked at the Allegheny County dashboard today and it said that uh, I think 36.6% of African-Americans in Allegheny County um, have at least been partially vaccinated, 12.8 um, partially and 23.7 fully. Um, how can we get those numbers up? And from your conversations, how are people feeling about the vaccine who have had it? Yeah, so we get those numbers up by really going to those communities and talking to them and having focused efforts specifically to those communities. If you think about when the vaccine first started, there was a disparity from the beginning. Um, the vaccine was targeted to healthcare workers. We are underrepresented in healthcare workers. So you're gonna start out behind. And then it went to an age-based vaccine access. Well, a lot of our communities don't reach the ages that that vaccine was targeted to, so those over 65. And so when you have disparities in how the vaccine was originally distributed, it's no wonder we're still playing catch up. And so now we're at the point that we really have to target our black and brown communities and reach them in the methods that they want to be reached. There was a lot of disparity with registering for vaccines. Not everybody in our community could go online and register. And so creating ways that people can just call in or even have walk-ups, those types of clinics are just now emerging. And so we have to ensure that we are meeting people where they are, that we are educating about this vaccine. I'm seeing a lot of hesitancy um, around myths with the vaccine and so making sure that there is a trusted resource, a community member, advocates that look and feel like the uh, participants, right? Um, as a medical doctor, I may be able to say some things about the vaccine, but they really want to hear from people in their own community, people who are the same age as them, people who have the same beliefs in them. And so we have to ensure that we are creating community partners, people that are walking the community, that live in the community, can, that can give this message that other people can hear. And it's continued effort, and it's going to be continued effort as we move forward with this vaccination. I, I, we were talking about targeting, and I remember when the vaccines were first being offered here in our area, a lot of them were in faraway places. I remember at the Dick Sporting Goods headquarters, and they were at Heinz Field, and they were out of these large locations that seemed great, but if you thought about a lack of access, if you didn't have a car, if there's no buses to get to a lot of these places. And I think at first the whole idea was just put it out there, but then it, it still kept people at arm's length from what they needed to get, pardon the pun. Absolutely, and that's why making sure that testing and vaccines are accessible in the communities where people work, live, and play is so important. 
we cannot just rely on the big vaccination efforts where you're targeting thousands of people that work with communities that can target 10 people, work with churches that can target 50 people, whatever we need to do to make the vaccine accessible where people can get to. I mean, looking at how do we get the vaccine into places where people go. Is that the physician's office? When the vaccinations first rolled out, they really weren't based in physician's offices. If it's a matter of trust and people have a trusting relationship with their provider, that's in the natural place for them to go. Um, they rolled this vaccine out in certain pharmacies. Well, not all pharmacies that in communities of color that had access to those pharmacies had the vaccine. And so making sure that we are having a strategic approach to this um, and we are looking at the data. I know that Mark referred to not having a lot of data. That data is going to be so important for us to find out where are there gaps in care, where are there places that have not been reached that we need to go out and get to in order to get people the vaccines that they need. Dr. Chris, um, I'm just going to kind of segue over to you. Um, you as a spiritual leader and a physician, um, you know the importance of, of that kind of, of saturation of a neighborhood and communities that, that Dr. Tracy was speaking about. How has that impacted your church, your congregation, and the people that you serve? Well, I, I, I think I, I'll start by saying that from the beginning of the pandemic, meaning when it became publicly clear that this was not just going to go away, um, many of what I refer to as the uh, elements of the help network in our communities stepped up and have been continuing to work, working together, working in partnership, cross-denominationally, cross-culturally, uh, and uh, whether it was meeting food shortages um, and trying to, to deal with food deserts, uh, helping with child care while essential workers were still being expected to go to work without proper PPE, um, whether it was helping children who were now cyber-based but didn't have access to the internet. We've, we've been stepping up as a community, but I think where the gap has been uh, really starts again with that rollout that we're talking about. You know, early on, the plan was that individual physicians' offices could uh, apply to receive the vaccine in their offices, provided they went through certain processes to get uh, qualified to administer the vaccine. So that was the first flaw. This vaccine is no different than any other vaccine that, that a doctor's office uses, but yet there were 10 different hoops that you had to jump through just to get on the list to receive the vaccine. Uh, but then literally days before the rollout of the distribution, the state changed and said, we're only going to distribute the vaccine to large commercial pharmacies and two health systems. And so that was the first flaw because now you had a network of people ready, trained, and now credentialed according to the process who could help meet some of those vaccine gaps that now we're standing there unable to do anything. Um, so, you know, it, it impacts uh, the, the faith community because many churches have not been open uh, since March or April of 2020. And so aside from uh, the, the impact uh, on our need as humans to want to gather and, and how uh, much of a staple the faith community has been in our communities, uh, it also has really shaken that help network because a lot of the help resources come from the faith community as well. People who need help with paying rent, people who need help with any number of things. Now when the physical building is no longer accessible, it creates challenges. Uh, so, you know, so it's, it's had an impact, uh, but uh, on, the, on the positive side, uh, I think a lot of uh, what I call micro churches now, which is most churches who have, you know, less than a hundred or so actively participating members have really embraced a lot of technology driven ministry and a lot of ministries have in fact grown in terms of their reach by the use of technology. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, so the, so the pastor in me uh, says that, you know, this is one way that God has shown us that we uh, can continue to minister in and through uh, these moments and seasons, uh, because even though this has caught us by surprise, this pandemic didn't catch him by surprise. Um, but, at, but as a physician, 
It's also, uh, you know, there's so, and I think my wife can, can echo this, that ministry and medicine are very, very similar in terms of engaging people, establishing positive and productive relationships, uh, being good at listening, embracing people's thought process, not judging people based on opinion, and trying to work together to achieve uh, mutually uh, agreed upon goals. So the two have gone kind of hand in hand. We're still uh, worshiping uh, virtually. Uh, we are hopefully, uh, prayerfully looking towards the kind of the middle of the summer, maybe Labor Day timeframe that we may be able to go back into the building. Uh, but like many of our faith community uh, brothers and sisters out there, many of our churches uh, because of the demographics, have a lot of still high-risk individuals. Because even though, just as uh, Tracy mentioned, the rollout began with uh, older individuals, it began with older individuals who are nursing homebound and many who are beyond the age of our life expectancy as African Americans. So we have a lot of multi-generational households uh, because our families, one, will care for those loved ones in the house, either because they can't afford nursing home care or because that's just what they wanna do. And they, I still get calls from individuals every week uh, because they have homebound individuals who still can't get vaccinated. Um, so, um, you know, so we still have some challenges and I think that the HELP network is here to help. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting that, uh, that the Allegheny County Health Department uh, continues to report that 12% of uh, their vaccine uh, at least goes out to African-American communities, um, which suggests that the remainder of these groups out there vaccinating people are woefully below that number for the number to be low. So uh, we've got some work to do, but I, I'm here to just suggest that we have a workforce that is ready and willing and available to be utilized. We've used well, you bring you bring two things to mind. My, the first question I would ask you is, have these gaps started to be closed up? All these, these, these inequities that you spoke of, having the big rollouts and then stopping the people who were poised to do that work, suddenly not having them be able to receive the vaccine. Have that, has that been addressed? Um, I, I think that's in some ways those gaps are being addressed. Um, I think now uh, the larger health systems, uh, just because there isn't a logistical need for these large scale mass vaccination events are now being much more surgical in their approach. Um, and, and so I think that is helpful. Um, I still think that the large number of available vaccine doses at commercial pharmacies, some of those could be used better to now be more surgical uh, and help distribute vaccine to these vaccine deserts. Um, and we know, where the, we know where the deserts are. Um, and, and now that's, you know, if we wanna see any meaningful increase in the vaccination percentages and get to that 70% that our uh, governor would like us to target, um, we're gonna have to now start to be very surgical about what we do. Um, and, you know, maybe that means reallocating doses of vaccine that are sitting in pharmacies not being used and come up with a way to utilize the people who wanna help and vaccinate people. Well, I would hope that there's some sort of advocacy and attention being paid to those gaps that you talk about, because there are several people, as you mentioned, in the community, older folks especially, who still need that special care. Um, and I did want to just say something about the HELP Network that you mentioned. That, that's historically been the way that, that we do things. I mean, in the church, there's these people who rise up and take care of those. I mean, if it's, if it's not something like this, it's taking meals to a home. It's making sure that everybody gets to the poll. So congratulations and thank you for doing your part in making sure that that, that safety net, that unofficial but so important safety net has stayed in, intact for so long. Um, Mayor Jones, I wanted to ask you, you're a role model for young people in our region, and um, Braddock is a well-known part of our area um, with an aging population but that's slowly changing, but mostly it's older working class folks. Um, have you seen similar gaps that, to what Dr. Chris and Dr. Tracy have been talking about, and what was your personal experience with the vaccination? My personal experience was actually pretty awesome because uh, I, my first thing is, I have a relationship with the community coordinators for a lot of the elderly apartments. So I called them and seen which ones had access to the vaccine and which ones didn't. 
And I, I was shocked that a, a lot of agencies stepped up as far as like real estate agencies. Um, and they made sure that their residents got vaccinated. And the ones that didn't, I arranged for uh, age and to come to them and say, hey, we'll vaccinate you here at your spot. And now we're at a we're at a point where it, it's very interesting. I have so many people knocking on my door asking, hey, can we have a clinic? Can we have a clinic? Can we host a clinic? And so far we've had three. <laughs> and I have, there are about three more in the works, but there's only about 2,100 residents in Braddock. I'm not even sure if that number is correct yet because the last census numbers haven't come out. So I imagine there's only about 1,500 residents. I would not be shocked, but- You immediately make me think though, like how can we model you? How can we use you <laughs> as the cookie cutter so that, that we can take that and spring off into all these other communities who need that kind of hands-on touch once, and the response Yes, once they said that the elderly could get vaccinated, I was like, I'm going to go to all the elderly apartments, properties and see who the community coordinator is and how can I connect the vaccine to them. That's great. And, and, and it sounds like the response to the people, they wanted to get vaccinated, right? They were yes. looking for this kind of help. I had an old woman hug me crying because she was so excited because for the longest, all we had was testing in the neighborhood. And I'm like, when are we going to get some vaccines? I approached the health department. They said no. But since AHN is right here in the community with our urgent care center, I partnered with them and asked them, would how could we make this happen and we made it happen and it, it was amazing that's so great I, I it's what an inspiring thing to do and to see because one of the things i noticed in the spots that we've been doing around this initiative are those real life stories and people are truly touched and grateful this isn't just you know a campaign this is life or death for people i mean they're they're in small communities and they're often taking care of other people and to be able to have that lifeline of the vaccine is it's beyond important. Um, I wanna pivot for just a minute and talk about um, the myths and the doubts out there that, that are still surrounding the use of the vaccine. Um, and again, I'll go back to you, Dr. Tracy. Um, one of the leading myths, there are so many out there. I've heard everything from once you've had COVID that you can't get it again, that the vaccination will actually give it to you. Um, but one of the main ones, especially amongst young people is that the vaccine can cause infertility. Can you speak to that? Yeah, that is a, something that we hear and is a major contention for our younger um, population. And it's absolutely untrue. And I have seen some of the social media surrounding that myth. In the social media, they are good at what they do. They're good at promoting that, but the science behind it is flawed. And so we have to come out as a medical community with equally good social media on a variety of platforms that really talk about the truth of this vaccine. And so for our younger population that are listening now, infertility is not caused by this COVID vaccine. Um, it, they're, they're, it just doesn't work that way. It does not cause that. And so whatever we need to do to um, make sure that the truth about the vaccines that are out there, such as this platform is so important, but it's also important for us to know specifically for each community, because as you said, there are many myths. And so just making sure that we are compassionate in our concerns and addressing those myths, that we don't just dismiss it and really go to the heart of what is going on. Right. I think that's another thing. When we hear these things, the worst thing anyone can do react and say, like, how could you believe such a thing? It's so important to be respectful because, again, going back to what Mayor Jones was saying about being deeply touched. This is important to people. This is life or death to them. And, and not having that correct information can really make a huge difference in how you move forward. Absolutely. Um, could I, could I um, just interject? Uh, of course just, you can, uh, go right ahead. Uh, you know, because just, just as Tracy said that we've gotta be compassionate and part of that compassion is also acknowledging the history, right? Because the prop, the, the danger with the internet is that it, it it sprinkles in truth and then adds to it a lot of conjecture and false information. So there have been very maliciously intended campaigns to sterilize communities of color, whether it's lead in the drinking water in certain cities, uh, mercury being used uh, as a sterilizing agent, whether it is 
nor plant in Baltimore where they were giving women money to, to basically uh, control their fertility. So there is truth to, to the myths. And so we so that's where these help resources that are just as Tracy uh, and uh, 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 our mayor have, have said, we have to give people the truth. And when it comes from people who look like them, who share in their experience, it becomes more validatable, I think, in my mind. So when we say, yes, you know, there is truth to that. However, here's the science as we know it about this vaccine and why we don't believe scientifically that it will impact your fertility. Um, and to be honest, if you, add to the, if you add to the myth, the truth, it often helps people better kind of modulate the, the myth because now they know the real story. Um, and they know that yes, there was some sterilization that went on and this is what happened for real, for real, as opposed to, I kind of heard that, you know, they've been trying to sterilize people. Well, there, it, it, was, it was true um, at the highest levels of government, um, but now this is what the now science tells us. So, uh, you know, and, and we could talk about it in any capacity, whether it's Tuskegee or Henrietta Locks, or, you know, there, there are myths and there's truth sprinkled in. And I think right. we are well positioned as health professionals, as community leaders to help guide that conversation so that people can make this the most informed decision that they can that they need to make. And painfully, there's enough history out there to make these things. As you said, any successful lie pivots off the truth. So having that history and that mistrust and not to mention just the other discrepancies that exist between communities of color and, and the practices and being able to receive medical care um, also helps feed into that. And I think another important aspect of batting that down is having people like yourself and Dr. Conti and this project where you have informed expert sources and opinions telling you, you know, here are the facts and I'm happy to discuss them with you, not in a dismissive way, not in a what are you thinking way, but in a real and informed way. Um, Mark, can I speak to you a little bit about that history? Um, I think we all here are well aware of the Tuskegee experiment, Henrietta Lacks, the gruesome numbers that came from Allegheny County about, you know, uh, mortality rates, rates for women who are, are giving birth and, you know, health discrepancies. How does the Black Equity Coalition and POISE wrap their arms around that and try to push us forward? Well, yeah, that's that's huge, right? Um, mm -hmm. so I don't know if anyone could necessarily wrap well, no. around that. Yeah. Uh, but part of it is the reason why, you know, we um, partner with WQED around this campaign, right? It's, it's about building trust. And so part of that idea about building trust is just what you see on the screen. You have a mayor who is representing you know, her community. You have doctors of color who are, are you know, science-based and sharing information. One thing that's critical, and I won't say this is true for every um, uh, issue that's happened against the Black community, but most of the issues that happened against the Black community were not created within the Black community. Right, it was some force outside of us, either using us to test us for something, or uh, you know whatever that is. And so, when you talk about building trust, what I would implore people is, you know, you, you don't know when something's on social media, you have no idea where that started from. Right, you don't know what the impetus of that was. It could be someone just putting a message out there before you know it is viral. So when we talk about trust, it's you know people in Braddock when Mayor Jones knocks on a high rise. Uh, in her community, people know who she is. So if she is bringing that into her community, then they're gonna trust her. If you have doctors on, on this webinar and you're sharing information, right? They're of the community. So there's gonna be a higher level of trust. And so what the Equity Coalition is trying to do is say, we are a group of you know, black people from a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different sectors. And we have uh, a lot of research behind us uh, that include places like Create Lab, from this, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, uh, the Western Pennsylvania Data Research uh, Center from University of Pittsburgh, Fourth Economy. These are people that we're using to help us collect good data, right? So part of it is making sure that we have good data that we can bring to the table, analyze that, and then share that back out with our community. Uh, I think it was Dr. Tracy who mentioned science earlier. We're not just sitting back here thinking about how can we create a great story. We're using the correct data, understanding how was the vaccine made, right? 
and then sharing that back out with our community so that you have accurate data. You're just not on social media hearing another myth. One of the myths that I keep continue to hear is that the government's trying to track us. So they're injecting us with a vaccine. If the government wants to track you, you can't see it, but I'm holding up a cell phone. That's the easiest way the government will track you because we all have one, we have it everywhere we go. That would be the easiest way to track us, right? So this vaccine, again, we are being disproportionately hurt by the virus. And so we're imploring people, look at your own health. Uh, Dr. Chris talked about the fact that a lot of our households are still multi-generational. I've got a, a niece in Detroit who's living with her grandmother. The grandmother just got shot, she's 80 years old. The niece is still not vaccinated and has people coming in and out of the house, right? Extremely dangerous. So if you're not thinking about yourself always, think about your family members. Mayor Jones, talk about that community of trust that, that Mark just mentioned. Uh, the initiative that you mentioned going into the apartment buildings and talking to people. There are partners in your community, actual normal everyday neighbors and people in the neighborhood, as well as larger things like AHN that you mentioned. Tell me about building that partnership and how that works. Building, building the trust, uh, just being that Braddock is such a tight-knit community. Everybody knows someone that knows someone. And for a minute, there, there was no one getting vaccinated. There was opportunity, but there was no one getting vaccinated until it, it kind of was a domino effect. If someone I know got vaccinated and I trust their judgment, I'm going to go do that too. Um, I ended up on a waiting list and uh, an older person canceled and I got vaccinated. So a bunch of my friends ended up getting vaccinated because they, they saw me do it. And it's that type of trust that you have in your community. Like when it came time to go knocking on doors and say, hey uh, guys, do you guys need help with the vaccine? And the I, I called, uh, I didn't call a lot of people no's. I just called them a slow maybe. Maybe this clinic isn't, this isn't for them. Maybe they'll come to the second one. And after we did it in waves and to the point where people were now asking, hey, when's the next one? When can I get vaccinated? I trust it. And I, I think it's it's having that dialogue and getting past all those myths and knocking on the doors and wanting to do the work. You can't just disseminate information in your community and say, hey, I did it, we have these clinics. It's, it's not gonna work to the point where I even roped in my state representative and I was like, Summer, I know you have an appointment coming up. You should come get vaccinated in the community. And she did. And we, we made a photo opportunity of it. <laughs> But that's great. That's exactly what, what Mark and everyone else has been talking about. It, it's like, you can be what you see. And, and Summer Lee is such a great representative of our area and the people that, that she serves. Um, I did want to ask you, Mary Jones, was there any one myth or, or, or misconception in particular that you kept hearing about that, that really spoke to you that you helped address? Uh, one of the myths were, uh, I'm not going to get the COVID vaccine because it has COVID in it. I don't want to get COVID. Or I already got COVID, so I don't need a vaccine. And they're like, you can get it as many times as <laughs> the universe feels that you need to get it. <laughs> you don't you don't need it more than once. Um, and I myself, uh, I thought I had a, um, a false positive, but after that first shot, the doctor was like, maybe it was a real positive. And just these re these relations and these openness with my friends and people in the community pretty much help uh, spread awareness to some of these myths and, and helped uh, build this trust that was very much so needed, especially a, a lot of the Black, we don't have a lot of Black doctors in the community, but there's a, a woman who has a, a, a family practice here and even she said she had gotten COVID before and she said the, she still got the vaccine because the side effects from the vaccine are better than actually getting COVID. Dr. Tracy, that, uh, Mayor Jones brought up something that I, I've often heard repeated that, that people don't wanna get the vaccine because they're so afraid of the side effects. Um, can you speak to that, that the side effects versus actually having COVID and how devastating that could be to a household as Mark mentioned? Yeah, I think one of the biggest concerns was when the Johnson Johnson vaccine came out and they talked about the clots associated with that. Um, and when you look at the numbers, the clot rate in just the general population was so much higher than the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. 
but even almost 10 times higher if you actually got COVID as a disease. And so um, trying to um, this, you know, um, make sure that we are stating the facts and the evidence and making it plain to people. A lot of times uh, the side effects around uh, the vaccinations are sensationalized on in media um, and really bringing again the truth of what is realistic. We know that smoking causes uh, blood clots at a higher rate than, you know, um, a vaccination and again with COVID itself. Um, you know, the side effects of, that majority of people have just not feeling well or having some arm soreness is no more common than any other type of vaccine. And so just really talking about that fact. Um, and so I think it's so important for us to relay the truth about the side effects, but again, relating them to everyday life. It's so much easier to isolate one thing and just say, okay, this is just from the COVID vaccine. But when you relay it to what everyday life is and what side effects are normally out there and what the rates are. I think another um, common concern was people were comparing vaccine to vaccine. And you really can't do that based on how they were studied. Each vaccine was studied um, by itself in its own environment and time frame. So it's very difficult to make assumptions from this vaccine to that vaccine just because of how they were studied. There has never been what we call a head-to-head -head trial comparing the vaccination. But we all know that these vaccines are safe and effective and they prevent the death and dying and the hospitalizations. And that's the key thing. Can you still get COVID after you get a vaccine? Yes, you can. However, you are not going to die. And the, all the vaccines have shown that you're very less likely to be hospitalized. And those are the things that we are trying to prevent because this disease is killing our community. I was just at the hairdresser yesterday and a friend of hers, 45 year old, passed away. We have to prevent this and vaccination is the way to move forward. Reverend Chris, how do we do that? I, 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 I totally agree with everything that, 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 that Dr. Tracy was saying, but how do we keep that message out there about the importance of this? People are still losing their lives. I, I think it, it has to continue to to be communicated through vetable resources. Um, you know, we if we could clone Mayor Jones and, and her energy and her That's approach right. and her engaging approach, um, you know, because I, I look at her, I look at her and I see her as being persistently uh, energetic, you know, knocking on those doors, being transparent, willing to answer questions, um, because those are the questions that still are hindering people. You know, you've got access, you still have access issues, but then you still have skepticism driving decision making. And so that message just has to continue to, to come from verifi verifiable, vetable resources, pastors, community leaders, uh, the mayor, the city council members, those individuals who are already identified. If you were to go into any community right now and say, give me your top 10 people that you would go to for X, you're gonna find that every community has that group. So maybe it starts with making, getting an, a, a sense of the, the COVID aptitude of the people in that group, what their mindset is. And again, not in a threatening way, but just get a sense of what it is. And then maybe begin from there and encourage them to help with the narrative. Because when it comes from, and we've seen this, you know, I'm sure Tracy can speak more to it as a family physician from a primary care and preventive health standpoint than from the emergency department. But there are a number of studies that have shown that specific help resource individuals, when the messaging comes from those individuals and in certain locations, like from the pulpit, for example, um, it carries weight. <laughs> and so I think in order for us to now overcome some of, you know, because because right now we're at this at this place uh, where, you know, after the fire has been put out, the, the firefighters don't let you back into your into your property because they tell you there could be a flashover. There's still smoldering embers. So right now we're beating down this fire, but there's still smoldering areas. And now we need to go in 
and be able to put those little smoldering areas out. And I think that's where the messaging has got to be directed. Um, you know, the, the coalition and all of the, the work that's being done by the coalition uh, and the people at the ground uh, level in the communities, uh, that's how that fire is gonna get extinguished. Um, you know, commercials are great, but I think the commercial, the time for commercials now is over. It's gotta be, you know, Mayor Jones knocking on doors um, saying, hey, you know, have you been vaccinated? Okay, and if the answer is no, hey, do you mind talking about, you know, what, what, what's your thought process behind that? I'm not here to judge you, I'm just curious. You know, oh, I notice you've got, uh, you know, kids in the house, have any of them been vaccinated? And then just have conversation. Um, you know, which is why I say so much of healthcare and ministry go hand in hand because it's that level of engagement. So I think that's the key is we've got to continue to engage people where they are in a respectful uh, way and people appreciate that. And they, I believe they respond positively. It's all right. It's Just, almost as if, you know, there's a community magnet out there. Um, Mark, did you want to say something? Yeah, just uh, real quick, I just wanted to add that a key component of the Black Equity Coalition is a community engagement group. And that's you know, what we're tasking them to do is be that two-way communication. So both pushing information out to our community, but always trying to gather information from our community uh, as it pertains to the virus and vaccines. But again, beyond that, right? Uh, a lot of disparities and health issues and comorbidities we had existed prior to the vaccine. So we need to create that trust relationship and be a vehicle that can share information again with our community, but also gather information from our community. Right, you've acted as that conduit that gets the word from these voices of authority that we have here tonight to actual people so they can apply it to their everyday lives. And, and you cannot underscore the, the, the importance of those community connections like the church and like doctor's offices and like Mayor Jones. I have one question um, from our chat how do we identify those who haven't had the vaccine yet? And how do we encourage them to get vaccinated in a way we kind of touched on that. But Dr. Tracy, um, how do we identify those folks? Do we do as, as your husband suggested, do we knock on doors and gently, that gentle persuasion that, that Mayor Jones has shown that's been so effective and say, hey, let's talk about this. Yeah, I think we own this issue, right? We are our neighbor's keeper. And so um, talk to your community members, talk to your friends and family, frankly, about the vaccine. We have seen those door-to-door -door methodologies work very well in engaging people when they when there occurs where they are, and that's going to be so important. Um, just to you know, piggyback off of the last conversation, the the health system I work for, UPMC, they they've noticed that they know that that system works. So have developed ambassadors. We know that. Um, individuals that work in our system come from our communities. And so why not engage everybody in this work and be in vaccine ambassadors to the community that you live in? Because that is who is going to make a difference. Um, making sure that, again, that there's access, that we're meeting people when they are. So not just knocking on the door and say, are you thinking about a vaccine? Okay, well, let's schedule you two weeks later, but okay, here, let's give it to you right now. And so really thinking outside of the box of how we deliver vaccines, how we reach out to communities is gonna be key to this. But this is all of our responsibility. We have got to care about our community as much as we care about ourselves. I'm really interested in this ambassador program that you talked about. How, what's the reception been like to that? And, and have they been able to take that extra step and not only just knock on doors, but actually put a shot in an arm? Yeah, so it's been very successful and they continue to get people who hear about, you know, being a UPMC vaccine ambassador and want to be engaged. We ensure that whatever communities we go into, that we let the ambassadors know we're going to go to this community. And there's so many volunteers that just want to help and want to get the word out um, and encourage their community to get vaccinated. So I think it's been very successful. And it's also made everybody feel value, made everybody feel that they are doing something to help mitigate this disease. And so in this pandemic area that has just been so stressful, it's brought a little bit of joy to people because we all want to help. And this has been a way for everybody to do that. That sounds great. And I noticed I was going to ask, so probably I'll ask Mark this. Have you noticed um, 
the hesitancy, not so much on the part of the people who need the shot, but the people who are providing that information. Have you noticed that they've recognized the fact that we need to do this differently? So that is a, <clears throat> that's a, a huge issue, right? Um, and, and what I'll say is that when you think about equity, equity doesn't mean that we do the same thing for all communities, right? The same way. So, you know, when Dr. Trace was talking about knocking on the doors, that's been something that's come after the fact, right? We put all these big vaccination clinics out there. We've done all these things. Now we're saying, let's go knock on doors. When you think about all the issues and the reasons why a lot of our community cannot access vaccines, then we should have thought about that at the beginning and said for the black community, especially for our elderly population, maybe we need to go to those places at the beginning right, and, be, and begin to vaccinate them, knock on doors at the beginning instead of at the end. So I think what happens is there are these inherent issues and people, especially at the larger levels, are not thinking through, you know, the inequities and how you have to deal with those. Uh, it, I guess if I'm sitting there at the state level, I'm saying, how can we get, you know, most people vaccinated as possible? And maybe I come up with these, uh, you know, major vaccine clinics. But when you start thinking about the impact that the virus is having on certain communities. If black people are two to three times you know, more likely to contract the virus and it's impacting us in a, in a much greater way, then that should have been the community that you are focusing on up front. And as Dr. Tracy said, when the state and then our county first started releasing vaccines, it was to a population 75 and older. There is a much larger portion of the white community that's 75 and older than the black community. So again, inherently, you begin to create disparities. The same thing as she mentioned with the health system. If that's who you're vaccinating, we don't uh, make up a lot of that population, you create these inherent disparities. And so we need to be thinking about those type of inequities at the beginning of the process. If we do, then we would start our interventions in a different way. And right now, that's, that's one of the things a coalition is trying to really uh, play a major role in is being at the table and trying to influence decision makers. So we have a monthly meeting with the uh, you know, PA Department of Health, Secretary Bean, Physician uh, General, uh, Dr. Johnson. We meet with our, our uh, county health department on a monthly basis, trying to provide you know, equitable information so that as they begin decision making, they have that lens. And again, I'm not saying it's intentional that they don't, why would they? They're not necessarily of our community, uh, at least the systems aren't. And so how can we provide that lens so that they understand, again, why these uh, uh, discrepancies exist and then how best to create the, the best interventions? Right, because we don't want to wait for another pandemic. So they say, oh, well, we know it didn't work this time. Let's try this this time. We want exactly. the systems to be adjusted now because it's not over. It's nowhere near being over. Um, so the work that you're doing and the fact that you're meeting regularly and actually like feeding it down to way it works more accurate, you know, it's like, it's invaluable that you have that. Exactly. And, and I tell our group all the time, this is the first time now I'm born and bred in Pittsburgh. You said I've been in the foundation world for a couple of decades and that's not my first entry into the business world. So I won't say uh, that, that just tells you there's a little bit of gray hair here. Uh, I've been here for a while, right? <laughs> This is the first time that I've seen a group of diverse Black people working in all different types of industry coming together to address equity in Pittsburgh. And so I think uh, because of who we are and we all have specializations or are really what I would call experts, and I always tell them I'm surrounded by a whole bunch of doctors, be public health and medical. I don't have those uh, letters after my name. So uh, I appreciate uh, you know, all the knowledge that's around us. This is the first time that I've seen in Pittsburgh, a group of us with this level of expertise come together using data, using science, but also using our connection to our community, not hearing things, but having lived it and bringing that to the table and, be able, and the ability to bring that to governmental systems, corporate systems and others to say, this is what equity looks like. And these are the steps you need to, uh, you know, to implement to really have an equitable community. Well, I, I remember that very first meeting that we had when we were just starting this project. And I thought, what a deep bench you have. Look at all the all-stars there that are just ready to put this plan into place. So I have to compliment all of you on the work that you're doing. 
Um, I don't even know where it went, but it is now 7.54. Um, so I would like to ask each one of you, um, I've been reading the paper and everyone's very happy and excited about the fact that the Allegheny County caseload dropped to less than 50 this week and both deaths and hospitalization rates are down. What does this tell us about the effectiveness of the vaccine and should we just not get too happy? Is this more like, okay, you've made it this far, where do we go from here? Dr. Tracy's nodding. Yeah, I, you know, I say that cautiously because I think what happens is people say this good news and say, oh, we're, we're free, we're headed in the right direction. You know, we're, we don't have to do all the mitigation. I think it's so important that we continue this push. Um, we need to really get to that 70% and preferably above that. And we're just not there yet. As things open up and people start going out and while some of the mitigation um, uh, implementation has been decreased. Masking is still going to be important um, because not everybody is vaccinated. And remember, we have children that we we don't have a vaccine for them yet, right? So anybody who's below the age of 12, there is no vaccine at this current time. And so it's so important for us to remember that and remember again. It's not just about you, but who you are around and who you are exposing um, and to continue to take those precautions. Um, so I just want us to be cautious, even though the numbers look good. Dr. Chris, can you add to that? And what are your personal feelings about the way that we should move forward? Um, so right now, you know, three to four out of every 10 people you walk around will not have been vaccinated, um, whether it's fully or partially. Um, you know, those are good odds if you're playing the Powerball. The Powerball would go out of business if you had a 60% or 40% chance of winning every single time. Um, so, but those are not good odds when you're talking about populations, um, uh, particularly unvaccinated children. You know, a year ago, uh, the, the case incidence rate for kids was about 0.5 per 100,000 kids, and now it's about 24 per 100,000 kids. Um, you know, so or 24% and about 5,000 per 100,000 kids. So the kids are, are the group because this is an equal opportunity infector. It's looking for vulnerable populations, i.e. people who are not vaccinated. And so we still need to be cautious, particularly with our young people. Um, and it's hard because now the weather is nice, people are traveling, uh, and not everybody who's out there maskless is vaccinated. And so we still have to exercise caution, be vigilant, um, be mindful of the fact that even when you're vaccinated, if you become symptomatic, the rules change. You are expected to test and quarantine. If you, have, if you fail a COVID screening test, even though you've been vaccinated, you are expected to quarantine and test. So, um, you know, we are, we are certainly looking a whole lot better than we were last May, last June, but we still have some work left to do. And, um, you know, I'm hopeful that by the time school starts, uh, you know, more of our school age children, you know, those tweens and teens will have been vaccinated and those clinical trials will be uh, you know, now ready to present their data so that we can modify the emergency use authorization to include the remainder of the school age population. Um, because the more school age kids we get vaccinated, the more quickly we can get back to normal in school. And that, you know, and our kids need that. They need to go back to school for any number of reasons. So I'm, I'm hopeful, uh, prayerful, um, and uh, as I tell, you know, the folks in Emmanuel, uh, many of whom live in Braddock and uh, I boast about their mayor all the time, um, you know, I tell them, you know, we are going to make uh, an evidence-based faith-driven decision um, because God is not a God of disorder. He expects us to use the information that he provides for us to make common sense decisions. He calls that wisdom. So um, we're going to keep pushing on and uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll be able to look back on this and talk about COVID in the past tense soon. Mayor Jones, how do we stay encouraged and yet stay vigilant? I tell people that right now is a good time to relax, but not get comfortable. No, it's a good time to breathe, but don't get comfortable because we have so much ways to go 
and we've made strides and it's nice to celebrate, but don't relax. Just breathe, <laughs> take a moment to breathe. That is such good advice. Mark Lewis, bring us home. Um, there's been, this has been such a great conversation, not just because of the people who are here, but the quality and the information. Um, you cannot dispute the science and the wisdom that you've heard here tonight. And I, I just thank you so much for having this idea. Tell us how do we stay vigilant and yet encouraged? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I can add much to what's already been said, right? Uh, I think um, the encouragement is the fact that, you know, our population is increasingly becoming more vaccinated. Um, at the same time, we're seeing rates fall, right? And, and that's all great news. Um, you know, somewhere this uh, over the weekend where uh, people were out uh, at the same time. So, you know, you don't know who's been vaccinated and who is not, right? So uh, because we don't know that, and when even today, when you look at the positivity rates, the positivity rates in Allegheny County for contracting the virus are twice, you know, uh, the number is you know, twice as high for Black people than it is for white people, even though they're both declining, right? So we still have that disparity that exists. And because we have so many other comorbidities, right, when we get the virus, it can have a greater impact on us than it does the general population. So, you know, as everybody said, yes, there's, there's, you know, we're moving in the right direction. If you want to move in the right direction faster, get vaccinated, mm -hmm. right? That would get us all closer to that place where, you know, as many people as possible are vaccinated. And, and the more people we have vaccinated, the less the virus uh, you know, chance it has to go around and spread, so. Yeah, and, and normalcy doesn't just mean doing what you used to do. Normalcy means being healthy and moving forward, more aware and better informed. I have to thank all of you so much for joining us tonight, Dr. Tracy Conti, Reverend Dr. Chris Conti, Mayor Charde Jones, and Mark Lewis. A uh, few folks out there watching us would like to know more about a matter of trust, uh, the COVID conversation that we've had tonight. Maybe you want to share this link. It will be available on the website at wqed.org slash vaccine. Um, there's lots of great information. There are links to all of the organizations we talked about, and especially to the Black Equity Coalition and the good work that they do. Um, reach out to someone in your community. I'm sure they're happy to help. And we will, too. Drop us a line. And thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you.